Hello and welcome to Crime Time TV. I'm Paul Burke and I write about books. Today my guest is Paul Vidic, who's talking about his book, The Mercenary, which is published today by No Exit Press. The Mercenary is the fourth in the George Mueller series. And uh, Paul was a senior executive at Time Warner when he decided to become a full-time writer in his mid-50s, completing an MFA at Rutgers and gaining a reputation as a short story writer. His novels are An Honorable Man, The Good Assassin, The Coldest Warrior, and now, of course, The Mercenary. A um, couple of points of housekeeping before we begin. You can see on the right, you've got the uh, list where you can actually have a chat room. If you wanted to chat, please uh, do so there. And at the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question section. If you want to ask a question, please do that. And I'll be more than happy to uh, ask those questions at the end of the interview. Um, so uh, one other thing, there's a little button at the bottom also, which is how you buy the mercenary if you're so interested. So please do that. Um, if we start then, welcome, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, and uh, thank you to Ian, of No Exit Press, who put this together. And thank you for all of you who are out there who have joined this event. It's my pleasure. Okay. Let's start with the origins of your spy novels, uh, the trail that led to an honorable man. Um, you were writing short stories, as I said, and no less a person than Juno Diaz said that um, you write, well, he recommended that you write a novel. So what led you actually then to the spy novel? Uh, it, it's, it, it's sort of a complicated story, but also a simple story. There was a personal tragedy in my family um, that had been a mystery for many, many years. And um, I was uh, invited to think about writing a novel. And I told my wife, the only story I know of is the story of my uncle, Frank Olson who was a weapons scientist uh, who died mysteriously in 1953. And his death remained a mystery until 1975 when uh, the Rockefeller Commission report came out and sort of inadvertently described him as having been given LSD the week before he died. And from that moment, uh, all sorts of stuff started coming out. We learned that he worked for the CIA. He was involved in anthrax um, uh, research. And he um, probably was murdered. Um, it isn't conclusive one way or the other, but as I began to look into his life, I, I found a man who struggled with his work. Uh, he, it was high top secret work. He couldn't speak to his wife about his work because it was top secret. And he couldn't share his doubts about his work with his colleagues because to do so would have been disloyal. And I found in that character a very interesting um, sort of conflict, somebody who was on the inside of things uh, who wanted to get out. And when I began thinking about a novel, um, I tried to write that story several times and failed each because I was too close to it. But when I well, set it we, aside- sorry, Before we get to that, because this actually does become the third novel, the story of Frank Olsen. Right. But I want to go into that a little bit, actually. Um, tell us about trying to write this as a factual story and even from a family angle as a first sort of uh, crack at it, if you like. Well, it's, when you're- when you're writing about your family, there's always the, the challenge of how much you should say, um, because the, you continue to have relationships with your family. And, and I, what I found was that I, was, I knew too much and I was holding too much back. And right. I really couldn't create the fully realized imaginary world that a novel requires in order to, to really take the, the reader on a journey. Um, so I took that character of my uncle, the, the elements of him, and I created this character, George Bueller. And the first book, An Honorable Man, was that character, a guy who'd gone to Yale, found himself in the nasty business of espionage, wanted to get out, but then sort of uh, continued on um, through the course of the novel, obviously. And then he's reappeared in, in a couple of other novels. But I love that character, you know, a smart man, an intelligent man who wants to do right, but struggles with the eth ethical and moral ambiguities that the work of espionage often presents. 
So then when we come to the first two books, you've actually got George Muller, the Mueller story, um, and he's actually uh, the cipher, if you like. He's actually the way of getting Frank Olsen into the story. It's, a, it's about this man who has these doubts, these qualms Correct. about his job, if you like. Correct. Exactly. That's how I... And it's, I think with all novelists, you, or at least I as a novelist, I start with character, setting and character. And if you have a character that's deep enough and interesting enough that you can explore all sorts of human questions, uh, then you've got, you've, you know, you're, you're on the right foot to creating a story that's compelling and interesting. Um, and certainly in the spy world, you know, there are stories that are very plot driven. Uh, and then there are other writers, Graham Greene, for example, Eric Ambler, uh, Le Carre, who, who start with character. And from the character, plots and stories emerge. And, 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 and that, I think, is why they're such great writers. They, they really explore the human questions, <laughs> which happen to be a little more severe and distinct. Uh, among spies. Yeah, it's an extremist yeah. world, isn't it? I'm just exactly. wondering. Sorry, Paul. No, exactly. I'm agreeing that it's, you're living in the a liminal space. Yeah. Between borders, where the laws and the rules that uh, you know we have to live by don't exist for them. I'm just want just going back a little bit. Did you think of writing this as a factual book? I mean, I think there are uh, reasons why that wouldn't work, really, aren't there? I did. I did. In fact, I wrote two versions. Um, the first version was to write it from the point of view of my cousin, whose father was Frank Olson. And the question was, you know, for him, how did my father die and why? Mm. And it was an investigation into you know, the case of his father's murder. Um, it was very, it, it was compelling, but it, 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 what it missed was, who were the murderers? Mm. And, and I decided in writing the, the book the way I wrote it, I decided to write it from the point of view of the murderers. And suddenly I found that you know people in the CIA who would be capable of murder, murdering somebody, a colleague, um, because that was what was required of them at the time, seemed like a very interesting premise. You know, the, the difference between the UK, the United States, and the Soviet Union is that the Soviet Union, when it had people who it uh, no longer trusted, uh, yeah. they could send them to the gulag. And <laughs> it was a, nobody, nobody questioned that that would happen. It was a fact. In the United States and the UK, what you would do with somebody who had state secrets in his head and was unstable um, became a much more complicated um, you know, problem. How do you deal with somebody? can't send them to jail because to the extent they know things and want to say those things, they're dangerous. And so yes, a, convenient, a convenient fall from the 13th floor of the Stadler Hotel was a, a way of dealing with the problem. What you did in Coldest Warrior, though, when you came to write that as the third book, which is actually telling um, Frank Olson's story, is you decided to fictionalize it. You've got a character called Wilson. And just explain why you decided to actually do that. Uh, it, it was it, by creating a character who was some of the world of my uncle, but not my uncle, I was able to give him a much uh, more complete life. I could imagine things about him that I, right. that I didn't know about my uncle. So if I had made him Olsen, I would always be coming up against what I didn't know. And if you're using somebody's real name, there's an implication it's his real life. And that limitation um, was something that uh, I think was was sort of a, a bit of a straitjacket. So yeah. by by turning it into a you know a fictional character, I was able to create a much more robust uh, imaginary world for the you know issues that he confronted. I think the other thing about the coldest warrior that's very interesting is that you chose to tell it as a story from inside the CIA. And of course, that gives you the chance to explore the moral complexity from the murderer's point of view, if you like. So. Well, exactly. And, you know, the, the CIA, MI6, the KGB, NKVD, they're 
they're, they're mysterious places to people on the outside, but inside there's a whole world uh, of secrecy that is shared. Um, and uh, it's a bureaucracy, they're all bureaucracies. Um, but inside these, these questions are debated. Um, I, you know, I could go back and look at all the records of the CIA from 53 and th th you could see the debate. It was all private, secret. Um, it went up all the way to Alan Dulles, who was the director of the CIA. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so it, it seemed to me by putting it inside the CIA, I could create an environment in which I could have the conversations being held. Um, uh, and so the, the reader would participate in those conversations through uh, people on the inside. Yeah. Looking at it from the outside, which is what my cousin did, it was always opaque. It was sort of a mist. And all you had were questions. And so what I thought I would do is find a way to have two people on the inside um, exploring the dimensions, um, knowing you know a lot more, and therefore you know providing the reader with um, a lot of information that allowed them to make to be entertained, but also to make their own um, judgments about uh, what was going on. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's what makes it a proper spy novel, if you like. Now, one of the things that um, is you this is a series in a sense, but it's a very loosely defined series. George Mueller actually uh, is in all of the books. He's not necessarily central to the books. One of the reasons for that is because you came up with a great character. So, you know, have him carry on is a, is a very good idea anyway. But I'm wondering if there's something perhaps a little bit more than that. What Mueller actually brings to the books. Well, well, I'll ask you, what do you think? What does Mueller bring to the books? I think he brings a sort of dignity and intelligence and um, uh, he, he's also somebody who's who's got questions about the nature of the work. Um, but I, from the beginning, I, I liked his character, but I also knew that I was very interested, not just in George Mueller, a character in a series of books, but I was really interested in the, the men and women who occupy or work in the CIA. And so I decided, um, and a little bit, I don't know if you know Jennifer Egan's visit from the Goon Squad. Yeah. Wonderful book. But what she does is she starts off with one character in the first story. It started as a group of stories. And that character becomes a secondary character in the second story. And in that way, she's able to sort of create a much broader group of cast of characters that allow her to build a bigger world. And so what I'm doing is in some ways creating a story about the CIA, not just about one character in the CIA. And that, that to me is exciting. It gives me, um, you know, I, I don't, not that I don't like George, but there are other people that um, I, I've discovered I enjoy a great deal also, like this character in The Mercenary, Alex Guerin. I was fascinated by him and uh, I made George Mueller a part of the novel, but the major central character in the book is a new guy, Alex Guerin. Right, it's will come to that, but it kind of, it, you sort of get the feeling that you're having George Mueller's story and then it changes completely. So, and you introduce. Right, exactly. Character. So it, he's, he's, he's playing. One of the things I would say in, in the stories is that George Mueller was a young man in 1953 when the yeah. first book took place. He had doubts about his work, but by 1975, which was The Coldest Warrior, the third book, he's back in the CIA mm -hmm. and he's sort of given up his young man's doubts. And he's decided that he is going to embrace his work in espionage. And the book now, The, uh, the Mercenary, he's yet even further advanced in his career. He's the chief of station in Moscow in a very important position. Um, but he still retains his, his youthful um, you know, doubts about the business. And he, he clings to you know, a sense of, of rightness that um, you know he's taken a task for, um, but he trusts. You know, one of the things about spies is, do, who do you trust and who don't you trust? Yeah. And Mueller sort of struggles with this question of trust um, because he's dealing with somebody who who himself is sort of untrustworthy. 
um, but he, he, he comes to a position where he's able to embrace trust. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an, a sort of poignant point in the novel, actually, not just for George Mueller, but for other characters where you suddenly realize that no matter what they think they feel, they don't have that level of trust or there's always a sort of doubt because of that. And, and looking at the kind of, I mean, so what we're talking about here when we talk about people in the CIA is, um, I suppose you're asking fundamentally questions like, for instance, what makes somebody who's decent do something morally dubious um, and sometimes extremely dubious? Um, what drives that? And that, that's what, I assume that's what you're trying to get at in the book. It is. It's, I, you know, it's the, the espionage is, a, is an unusual world because um, people lie in the service of truth. They suborn friends in the service of national security and they commit extrajudicial assassinations in the service of justice. Mm. And, and that hypocrisy is both appalling and entertaining. And yes. there is no other job title, uh, that in, at least in a free society like we live in, where um, that is, you know, as apparent as it is, um, except in uh, the intelligence services. Um, yeah. And John, John Le Carre, you know, who I greatly admire, um, you know, and, and Graham Greene and the human factor, they, they embody um, those questions, uh, you know, brilliantly. Um, well, it's, it's one of those things about human beings is that they seem to manage to hold two diametrically opposed ideas in their head at the same time. One that applies to them and one that's some kind of standard for everybody else. Um, but as you mentioned, John Le Carre, let's move on to that. Tell us a little bit about why The Spy Who Came In From The Cold is so important to you. Um, what do you think John Le Carre actually brought to the spy novel? Well, um, so I, I had read, after I read, uh, the first book I read of his was Spy Who Came In From The Cold, and uh, it, I read it when I was a young man, and uh, it was sort of a breathless read. He, it was so grim, so real, uh, I, I couldn't put it down, and not many books have touched me in that way. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm somebody who liked, you know, adventure stories, I like Graham Greene, and so um, Le Carre, the novel just has this um, dark, gritty quality, sensibility to it. Um, and, and the characters are very sympathetic, even though they're, they're you know, they're dark and, and flawed in many ways. Uh, the characters um, are very sympathetic. Um, I went back after I read it and I read his first two books, which are not very good. In fact, you know what what I saw in in what I came to learn about the way he wrote the first book is that he was sort of desperate in his own life. He was living in Berlin. He was going through a divorce. Um, he wasn't sure he wanted to do what he was doing, which was you know working for MI6. Yeah. And and it, you know it, it sort of came out all at once over the course of like forty five days. And 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 what he had done is he tapped into a vein uh, of his that um, produced this remarkable work. And then, you know, he, he then went on and wrote some other terrible books. <laughs> or not terrible, not good books, but they were sort of romantic books. And, and it was only when he went back to the Smiley books about eight years later that he really found his place. And that was to examine English class society through the lens of, you know, espionage and spies and the games that these men play, you know, the the, pol the political games, the sexual games. And um, and it just, he does it at this, this with this um, eloquence uh, and this brilliance that, uh, you know, in, in my mind, I think it's true, other people believe this. You know, he's gonna go down as one of the great um, writers in English uh, yeah. in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and he captured something that, that most people don't sort of recognize, but which is very um, important, you know, in, in the life we now live in, which is that we all live in and work in um, sort of organizations, bureaucracies. And, and a lot of what he 
does by looking at the 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 the, the things that go on in the office life is um, sort of the secret things, the backstabbing, the political um, machinations, the ambitions. Those are things that we all sort of experience in one way or the other. And I know in my case, I worked in a big corporation and I learned everything I needed to know about the spy business by, by working in a corporation and having to sort of make things happen. You know? So there's some, what people don't usually recognize is that the, the CIA, MI6 are really bureaucracies. And within those bureaucracies, there's a lot that goes on, but the number of people who actually work in covert operations is quite small. Um, although they, we think of them as the spies and they are. Yeah. yeah. Interesting though, you got onto that. I mean, I definitely wanted to talk about that. You said that, that working for Time Warner in a sense was, uh, it gave you an idea of what it would be like in the middle of the CIA. Well, it's, 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 uh, I was senior enough to, to, to be in a position where I had to uh, build my case for programs and initiatives. So I had to create allies with the, in the organization. I needed to get budgets established. I need to um, uh, watch out for people who, you know, were ambitious and wanted, you know, some of the domain that I was responsible for. So all of this is going on, you know, and, and, and in it, you still have to do your job. The same is true in the CIA. There is always a question of what are the most important um, concerns at a, at a moment in time? Where is the risk? Is it in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Lebanon? And everyone's competing for, to push their agenda, you know, with, wherever whatever res they're responsible for and 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 nobody thinks about the cia in that way generally at least in a fictional sense but it's what um if you were to talk about if you were to talk to to ex-agents you know they would spend a lot of time talking about um you know th the challenges it was to sort of um get your voice heard um and everyone is sort of uh you know, finding you know finding themselves in a in a sometimes toxic environment. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Um, well, that's the thing that um, institutions kind of get that they have their own life. You know, you you've got the concept. If we take it from a spy point of view, you've got the concept of patriotism. You've got the concept, personal sense of uh, morality and issues in family life. But when you join a big organization like that, it also it becomes its own self-fulfilling thing doesn't it and people then have to fall into line with that do you see that oh absolutely it's it's the challenge in in an organization is the the goals in a corporation for example are to achieve profit mm. and and the question becomes um how do you do that and you know there are situations like G general motors for example who uh, you know might have done things regarding relaxing the way in which they created safety concerns in cars, knowing that there was a risk somebody would die. And within the organization, there are gonna be people who are saying, well, we need to do this because if we don't, we're gonna lose a lot of money and you know, we can't lose money. And there may be other people who said, hey, this lives are at risk. And, and it, I think every corporation um, has, has those elements to it, you know, the, the yeah. notion of a whistleblower out there exists not only in government, it you know, exists in corporations as well. Yeah, um, and this of course is the point, it's how far people actually buy into this and then start altering their morality off the back of something like that. Correct, correct. You know, the, the, the people who do things because that's what they think their bosses want them to do, not what they yeah. think they should do. Um, I saw that, at, you know, at many levels. And th the same is true within the CIA. It's just the difference is what's at stake mm. uh, is, is, is larger, um, particularly as it has to do with, you know, wars, conflicts, um, issues of human rights. Um, and so, but it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> It's, and that's why I, I was attracted to writing about this because my characters, you know, I like to, to explore things, those types of things. So an honorable man explores the notion of honor. Um, the, 
the, the, the mercenary explores the question of um, trust. Um, and each of them uh, explores, you know, slightly, they all explore the, these issues together, but they all explore some sort of moral questions that are yeah. you know, confronted by the, um, the main characters. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, the mercenary then. Um, let's tell people a little bit about it, first of all, if you would, please, Paul. Um, the novels. Just, just set, mercenary, yeah. If you t just tell us the basic premise of the novel. The, the premise is that um, there's a character uh, who, a Russian, who um, wants to be exfiltrated from the Soviet Union in 1985. And the first attempt to do so fails. They bring this uh, character, Alex Garin, out of retirement, so to speak and bring him to Moscow. And his challenge is to um, do something that's never been done by the Americans, which is to exfiltrate a very senior um, KGB officer. Right. If we look at the research element of this, first of all, um, well, there's one small element, which is that uh, the COVID crisis interfered a little bit with the research. Tell us about that first, please. I Yes. Yeah, so I'm, for some time, I was a little embarrassed to, to say that I wrote a novel in a city I never visited, and uh, and but fortunately, that didn't seem to stop the novel from being praised for its sense of setting. In fact, yeah. I think the the Times in the UK has just come out with a thing where this, the reviewer calls the the setup, the setting, the grimness of the of the book masterly. So I was I was delighted when I read that. But in any case, the I had you know as I do with a lot of all my novels, I start with a setting and I chose Moscow. I read the autobiographies of a number of um, KGB officers to get a sense of the, who these people are. And then because of the pandemic, my intent to visit um, was um, sidetracked, and I I had to do what I could do, which was to go to Google Maps and Google Street View, which allowed me to do what I call location scouting, mm. which is to find the streets that my characters walk down, to find the buildings where they would live, to follow their routes through the city so that when I write the novel, it feels like it's you're there uh, without, yeah. and all of these details have to be transparent so they don't call attention to themselves, but they, if they're done right, um, you feel like you're there. It's its a little bit like Charles Dickens, who wrote The Tale of Two Cities in 1859 uh, about Paris in 1789. Yeah. <laughs> and you would never know, I mean, he'd been to Paris, but he certainly hadn't been to Paris in 1789. No, no, but when you read not. the book, you don't know that because he did such a brilliant job of creating that sense of place. But I mean, I mean, we all kind of feel we know Moscow anyway as spy fans, don't we? We know Red Square and we know Zerzinski and you just well, think yeah. we've just come across these things so often. But um, I mean, more important research, of course, was um, this was a book about this, the KGB. And, and that's where you started, wasn't it? You do an awful lot of deep factual research in the first place, don't you? I do. Um just to get a sense of the history, in 1985, Moscow was still at the end of the Afghan war. It was the end of the Soviet Union. It was a crumbling system. There was a grimness. There were lines. Uh, there was constant surveillance of Westerners. Um, and the best, for me, the best way of getting into the heads of characters is to read the autobiographies of similar characters. So right. there were a number of Russians who, who had left, defected, exfiltrated whose autobiographies were sort of wonderfully done. And they really allowed me to get into the heads of the characters and sort of pick up their voice. Um, and, and that all went into my primary character, this um, KGB officer, um, Petrov, who um, yeah. Yeah. is the, the subject of the exfiltration. Looking to defect, yeah. Um, and if we look at that, and one of the things you mentioned there, and it seems very interesting to me, is that um, Moscow, in a sense, in 85, was a very illusory place. I mean, it's the heart of an empire that actually isn't much of an empire really at all, isn't it? Yeah, it was... It was um, it, 
I was going to say they give this impression that everything is very ordered and organized when in fact there's a lot of fighting between different bureaus of the KGB. Everything is crumbling around the war in Afghanistan. You know, um, it's not really a very organized sort of structure at all in truth, is it? No, it, it, and there was a lot of corruption in 1985. Yeah. Um, and what you found was that, um, uh, and Dropoff, who was, became the premier, had been the head of the KGB, and he, the KGB for him represented one of the few places where there was still integrity, and, um, and they were charged with sort of pursuing anti-corruption um, trials. And the KGB, unlike the CIA and the FBI, which are two organizations, each one is internal, one's external, like M5 and one i 6 KGB is everything. And there was the domestic KGB, the foreign intelligence branches. But in any case, the entire KGB was very uh, involved in this anti-corruption activity, um, which was, of course, all came about because there were scarcities, there were there was inefficiency in the in the economic system, um, and and crime, you know, particularly corruption. Um, became a part of life. Um, and, um, and and that, you know, actually plays a part in the novel. Um, there were people who, uh, in the novel, who, who, you know, play with, you know, what goes along with power, which is corruption. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it does, it does very much play into the plot. Um, I'm thinking it, it's something that this comes up. I'm, a friend of yours, Joe Cannon, um, once said about, the research you know if you can spot it then it's been done badly but right. there's, you've got two things in your book you've got this moscow of 1985 but it also relates to something that happened a few years before so you've got the past coming in i'm just wondering right. is that a difficult thing to do and does dialogue play a little bit in part in how you actually manage to um show not tell if you like dialogue for me is um is critical. Um, I I've tried to write uh, plays, and, and the, the the wonderful thing that writing play does for a novelist uh, is teach you that in the playwriting space, the only way that you can convey information is through speech, and 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 speech tends to be very efficient way of right. getting things um, on the page. And, and it also benefits because if, if the speech of the character is authentic, you're also revealing the character through what they say, through jokes, through, um, you know, into intonations. And so for me, there is a lot of dialogue um, and because it's a way of, of actually getting the reader closer to the character. Um, so, um, it, it, a lot of the background that you were referring to mm. is presented in speech, somebody else telling somebody what happened. And if you think about it, uh, the Odyssey is all about speech. You know, the first four chapters are the Telemachus, and then, you know, you find Odysseus having, you know, in an island, and he's telling what happened over 20 years to this audience. You don't think of it that way, but it is speech. Yes, and yes, yes. and uh, so it's a uh, you know one of the wonderful things of you know reading great literature is that you figure out how other people accomplish what they accomplish, and they do it in a way that is um, sort of transparent. Um, how about we chat a little while now about the two characters? Then um, the two most important characters, I think, in a sense, you've got Garin, um, who you've already indicated you you know, you really uh, liked as a character and of course, Natalia as well. And to say that they were stuck in the middle of a moral, moral maze would be an understatement. <laughs> I mean, um, but what is it about these complex characters? Tell us a little bit about Garin and then tell us a little bit about Natalia. Um, so Garin, there's a, there was an American television show called The Americans, yes. which was about the illegals. And these were Russians who were planted in the United States, living as Americans, they were supposed to sit there and wait until there was a conflict, and then when they would 
emerge from their foxholes and you know be part of the fifth guard. Um, so I, I created this character who is a little bit like that. His mother married an American during World War II in Moscow, was raised as an American, but was really Russian in his mother's mind. And she has him join the CIA. And then, but, you know, as, as people do, they reject their parents. And he sort of rejected being a Russian mole in the CIA and, and then became basically a double agent. Mm. Um, but was this person who had this, this complicated life, uh, you know, he had a, 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 an American mind, but a Russian heart. So when he yeah. goes back to Russia, you find him interested in Russia as a place where his father was, you know, born and died, mm. and and in your you, all of these personal connections to Russia um, work at the same time that he's a spy trying to exfiltrate this, you know, this yeah. Petrov out of this country. And so I, I was very interested in in that sort of. Uh, in that question, because spies are people. They have all these same issues, families, children, parents, divorces, and yet they're going about their work. And in his case, he had this emotional connection to the land of his father that um, plays a part in the way that the story plays out. And he happened to meet this woman, Natalia, who has her own complicated life. She's living in Moscow in a big apartment that's sort of somewhat, um, you know, dilapidated. But the reason she has this big apartment is her grandfather, who was a bourgeoisie, um, had um, been a lawyer who defended Lenin. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the true story. And as a result, you know, was able to keep this big apartment when everyone else was sort of, you know, given small apartments. And then her father died, grandfather died, and this young woman has this big apartment to herself. Um, it's sort of the backstory. <laughs> but it's, it's so every character has this backstory, which is, you, you don't really, it, it, it helps to know it. But what's important is that you, you sort of understand that there's this deep history to these characters when they come together. And, and that, you know, so I found her a very interesting character. She's, she's a very Russian woman. She's a strong woman. And, you know, Russian women are, are unique because they were freed in order to fight during World War II and then work in factories. But um, they were never freed from all their home duties. So you have these women who would be in the world, uh, but then have to go home and cook for their husbands and take care of the children. And um, in some ways, Russian women are much stronger than Russian men. Um, and, um, and she sort of fits into that category. I think the beauty of the way you draw both these characters, and as you said, actually other characters as well, is that you can never be sure which way they're going to jump. And that's the whole <laughs> point of the surprise in the story, because you don't know what does he go with his Russian heart? Does he go with his American head? Um, when it comes to Garin. So you just don't know this. And, and that gives the story a freeze on right the way through. Um, is it true that you actually have a dossier on all your characters? I do you kind create... of this impression of a kind of Stasi file system that you've got <laughs> somewhere, you know, relating to your characters. Well, it's, I call it a dossier, but what, it, I, what I do is I, I create a resume about the, who they are, you know, where they were born, you know, who their parents are, you know, their favorite drink, their religion, anything that makes them unique and interesting, um, I try and have written out so that when I when I actually start writing the novel, these are people I know very well. Mm. And I can describe, I could go on for, you know, a long time to talk about them um, because I've created them in my imagination. Um, and uh, and I think that's very helpful to have because then all of that obviously you know shows up somewhere in some way in the in the novel itself. And you think about you know all the great literature. What we really remember are the characters. Yeah, absolutely. we remember the story, but the characters are what we remember. And what we remember about them 
are their complications, their their uniqueness, the the, the way in which you know they're not dull. They're they're fascinating people, and but they're not people. I mean, they're inventions of the of of two minds. The first mind is the writer, and the second mind is the reader. The reader has to complete the story yeah, yeah. by enjoying you know the work. Um, and it's it's fascinating to me, you know, when I have you know people read the book. Different people, you know. Obviously, I wrote one version of the book, but different readers come away with you know different appreciations of it, and that's because they're doing half the work. They're finishing my job by reading the book. Was it more complicated with Russian characters in the sense that um, you have to get this kind of fatalism or the the sorrow in the soul of the Russian, perhaps? Was that right? The, the that sorrow has to be behind the, them, the way the they Russian. talk and that's so on. That's a, a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> and it, it's, I, I am half, my father was Slovenian. Right. I'm a Slovenian citizen in addition to being an American citizen. Um, so I was somewhat familiar with Eastern European sensibilities and, and male sensibilities. So Bulgarians, Romanians, Slovenians, Russians, there's a sort of character uh, which you know you come to understand the way that um, the, they're sort of fatalistic, as you said. Um, and what you find is that um, some of the the saddest men have the best jokes uh, or the most interesting humor. And that's certainly true. You know, the Russians in my novel or the Bulgarians I've met. You know, when you've when you've sort of lived in a in a in a hard country, um, you know, the, the humor is a way that you know you deal with the uh, the difficulties of life. Oh, well, let's talk about that because um, humor also features in the novel, and as you said, because it's Russian humor, it's very dark. I, I think of one joke um, about um, the cellar, the basement of the Lubyanka. <laughs> this view in all Russia, you can see Siberia from there. <laughs> it's a very dark joke, but humor does play an important part in the serious novel too, doesn't it? Absolutely, I think that, you know it's that's to for a for a, a tragedy to really work, it has to have comedy or humor. I mean, think of Hamlet, great tragedy. But there are three or four clowns in that. You know, the grave digger, Polonius is a clown. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, seven people die. He kills his mother, you know, his father-in-law, uh, his uncle. But it's, it's a very funny play in many places. And for the tragedy and the drama to work, it has to be um, infused with lightness. The lightness sort of is a way of um, enhancing the the, the yeah. drama and the tragedy. Yeah, it increases the punch. But we'll exactly. go back to Le Carre now, um, because I think, well, first of all, this novel feels more pared down, and that feels a lot more like The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. But I'm also thinking you, you added some things here in the book um, that are very related to the the essence of the spy who came in from the cold i don't want to go into too many details because we're starting to put pictures in people's minds about that what i'm basically asking though is is this an homage to um, the spy who came in from the cold absolutely um in fact uh i didn't really i didn't start it that way but um after it was done i realized that I had given my character, whose name is Alex Guerin, A-L-E-K, uh, almost the same name as the main character in the spell came in from the cold, Alec, A-L-E-C, Lemus. And and it's and, and I'm sure it was, I know it was unconscious, but I'm sure it was, it was, you know, the uh, my way of uh, you know thanking Le Carre for having written that book, which, you know, had a, a big impact on, on me as a, as a writer. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's a very different story, um, but, oh, yeah. but, 
but the the some of the sensibility you know east berlin in 1962 which was when his book is set yeah it's not that different in its grimness and its sensibility to moscow in 1985 it wasn't a divided city but uh moscow in 1985 was a denied city a denied area if you were a Western there, you couldn't walk around freely. There was, and particularly if you worked in the CIA, there were you know thousands of surveillance teams that the KGB put on Americans when they left the embassy. You know, it was uh, it was a it was a dark time, um, and um, and that to me was also one of the things that found it that made it interesting. Um, and I did write it from the point of view of Americans in Moscow, not Mos you know, not Moscovites, although yeah. there, there is some of that, because I wanted to give that sense of claustrophobia, um, which you don't That's really, true. you don't see that today in Moscow, but, but it was very real in 1985. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just to lighten it up a little bit then, um, but there's now another book in the series. You've actually written the next book, haven't you, Matchmaker? I did. It's done. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, because that, I think, leads us into another area we're both kind of keen at talking about. So if you're a spy novelist, there are really four cities that you have to write about. Right. It's Moscow is one. Beirut is another. Hong Kong. And Berlin. And I chose Berlin. It's my next... Uh, is my the next place to set a novel, right. and I chose it uh, Berlin, nineteen eighty nine, which was the end of the war, which was November 9th, nineteen eighty nine, and and it, again, it like Moscow it was a it was East Berlin was a crumbling system at that point in time, and um, West Berlin was this little island in a large red sea. And uh, it didn't have any of the, and it had this incredible music scene. Um, West, Ber West Germans would go to e West Germany and uh, West Berlin in order to, to participate in the punk scene that was there. So you had this, this wild scene uh, in this small you know, city surrounded by a fence. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of a, a perfect place to set. Uh, a novel and a spy novel, uh, you know. I don't was, know if you've had a chance in America. Great. Have you, you know, heard of a series called uh, Deutschland 89? Yes, yes. It's the, they, they've sort of spoofed the story. They, it's rather an incredible thing, but it, it does. It covers when you were talking about the punk music and all that, it sort of brought back the image of that. But to get back to the point, there is, um, of course, you have a female character as the lead in this book, don't you? Yes, I do. I I, um, I was I found that the the female characters in my first three books tended to be the moral center of the book. They were the ones who would sort of call out what was right and wrong, and and I found myself very intrigued by that. And so I decided that um, I would make the central character of the next novel a woman. Um, and she's not a spy, but she actually I wits the spies in the world that she's in although she um it's a little bit like the eric ambler you know story which is you know the innocent person um has to sort of prove their innocence in order to get out of some dilemma that they've confronted so she's in that category you know she's forced to do something in order to get out of the, yeah. the we won't tell people too much about that we'll, no. we'll let them hang for that one let them deal with the mercenary first but, but it does bring uh, us to this point i mean you've written about women writers and women spy writers these days i mean yes. we live in a very changed world um gina haspel in america and stella remington in the uk you know there's a lot of change in the real spy world but there's an awful lot going on in with women writers of spy novels now and i wonder what you thought of that i think it's it's great i mean it's uh you know the the spy business um you know, tended to use women in the 50s and 60s as secretaries or, you know, targets, flirtatious targets. Um, but now in the United States, as you said, Gina Haspel had been the head up until the new guy. Um, and three of her direct reports were women. 
So you had women at the highest level of the agency. And I think what, you know, the, the, the real world follows, um, fictional world follows the real world. And I think now what you've seen for the first time is some really wonderful women writers um, who are writing spy novels. Um, you know, Gail Linz, which is, she wrote um, Masquerade, which I think was, you know, bestseller this is like 15 years ago, it was the first American woman to write um, successfully in that space. But mm. you now have, you know, Kate Atkinson has done it, Lauren Wilkinson has done it. Um, you know, there, Rosa, there are, I think we put a list of names up for people anyway, because I know this is the thing when you get to it, the names don't come so easily, do they? But there's a list there for people to have a look at anyway, um, which which I think makes the point. I want to talk about one more book because I, I, I said to you yesterday, I think, when we were, were looking at doing this, setting this thing up, um, it surprised me a little bit to see you loved The Day of the Jackal, the Freddie Fultz Life <laughs> novel, and I, because it's so different from uh, the spy who came in from the cold and, and the literary novel that um, John le Carre set out. Just tell us a little bit about why you like that novel, please. Um, it's it's uh, it's got a very um, compelling premise, which is um, it, there's an attempt to kill Charles de Gaulle. And of course, when the book came out, we all knew he hadn't been killed. So how do you sustain interest in something where you know the ending already? Um, but Forsyth, who had been a journalist, um, had a writing style which was very compelling. It's 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 not an interior writing style. He's, he doesn't dig deeply into his characters' minds, but he was able to create what I'll call the alternating um, uh, narrative, which is he right. you you see the jackal in what he's going through, and you see him see the police following him, and then you see the main policeman who's following the leads. And that um, back and forth creates a very interesting dramatic narrative structure, which you know he's, he did, did better than anyone else. And his writing is very graceful. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's literate, very literary as well. Um, so it just, it's, it's just, it's a very compelling story and a very, and compellingly written. Um, I think one of the things that stands out is if you can know the end of a book before you read the start, because obviously he can't kill the goal. Then right. it has to be a very good book to grip you then for the, it's for the whole journey. It's all about how you tell the story. And he told it in a very convincing way. Um, and, uh, and it's, I think, you know, when you read the list of the top 100 best thrillers, you know, mm. it always is on one of those lists um, and, uh, and deservedly so. I think we're, just before we go to a couple of questions, I just want to finish off on one point. Because your books are set during the Cold War, um, was that a simpler time in a sense? I mean, I'm, but, I'm now, with hindsight, it. everything is simpler <laughs> because nostalgia <laughs> is a simplifying emotion. I don't think we thought it was simpler when it, right. when we were in the midst of it. Um, but I would say that there's a kind the, of nostalgia for it now, though, isn't there? There is, and I think one of the things is that you know we sort of knew what the the parameters were. You know, we you know the Cold War and the the likelihood of annihilation was all much simpler. You know, the war on terrorism is much more complex because it's stateless. We don't really know how it's going to hit, where it's going to hit, uh, and how we deal with, you know, religious um, um, you know, extremism. Uh, whereas the Russians who are our adversaries, we knew were rational men, and we could depend on their rationality and our rationality for to to prevent you know an accidental nuclear it's war really destruction exactly and and I don't think we have the same confidence right now in the the, the way that you know the conflicts around the world you know are are you know, playing out um, so in some ways it's simpler um, but we didn't think of it as simpler at the time no indeed um, well a similar question but but somebody's asking on on the um the questions from the uh, guests it says why are we fascinated by espionage novels 
Um, I think we're, we're, we're fascinated by people who are permitted to do things that we can't do in our own lives. Um, spies, you know, as I said, suborn friends in, you know, the service of national security. They lie in the service of truth. Um, we all lie a little bit in our lives, but they're sort of white lies. These people, however, lie um, for their business. And, and so they create masks for themselves. Um, they go under deep cover. And that's a world that I think is sort of fascinating to us. We all like to, in some small, innocent ways, you know, uh, pretend. But these people are pretending um, for their business, for their job. And I think that's sort of, a, you know, it's exciting in a way. And we have a question from Lee Russell, who's a novelist um, here, um, about, Hi, about um, action in the novel and that combination. I mean, how do you feel about action in the novel? You, because you, your novel is very much character driven. It's very much dialogue driven. But of course, there have to be points of action. There have to be things that happen and things do happen in the novel, of course. Um, I think uh, every every novel has its rhythms, and I think um, dialogue is a particular form of rhythm. But action is an important thing, and um, and it, you know, and it, 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 and people die, and you know, a death has. To, there's a sort of action that goes along with the murder or the death, and uh, and um, I think action is something that. Uh, is is a way of both um, tying a knot on a story. Certain things happen, and an action, a death, concludes it. Um, but I would say the thing about action is is sort of how you make it compelling for the reader. And you know, the what I what I tend to do is is uh, when the action is hot, the language gets cool. Um, you don't want to over dramatize with you know adjectives and adverbs, you know action that is really working the mind of the, the reader, and so you you can understate um, action itself and still have it be um, you know a powerful part of the the story. And we have David asking, what books are on your shelf? Um, actually, the. Um, the book that you recommended yesterday, which was um, ah, the, Edward Envoy, the Envoy by um, right. Edward Wilson, who um, you recommended and, and I, I intend to read. Um, it's, uh, you, you've described him as somebody who uh, is a wonderful writer in the, the spy genre. Um, yeah, I think he's a literary writer. Um in the same sense that you are. So, you know, I, I think you'll, you'll find a lot in there. Yeah. Um, was Oleg I was going to say other, other books that I recommend, you know, it's, uh, you know, Charles McCary, who I've read yes. a number of his books, but he's just, he's described as the poet laureate, laureate of um, American spy fiction and not particularly well known, um, uh, probably in the UK, but, um, just it was at one time. He was in the 70s when he started publishing those books. But there are a number of authors who, unlike John Le Carre, of course, he, he kept working until last year anyway. But unlike him, have sort of seemed to have vanished from the scene. They, they vanished when the Cold War vanished, in a sense. <laughs> Unfortunately, Charles McCarry is one of those. But absolutely, if I was preparing any kind of top 10 list of um, top spy authors, Charles McCarry would absolutely be right up there. So the other one that I'm reading right now is Kim by Rudyard uh, Kipling, um, who right. and that was in some ways one of the first spy novels. You know, it uh, back when there was a, a an English empire. It's it's sort of the far flung um, adventures um, in India, but it's a wonderful book, um, beautifully written, um, and in one of the first novels where a spy-like figure um you know is a is a major character yeah unfortunately we we're running out of time or we're not running out of time we have run out of time we don't really have time to discuss the difference between american and, and english fiction uh, spy fiction 
Um, but Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for everybody watching. I just want to say to people again that The Mercenary is out today. So congratulations on that. It's available from No Exit Press. And as I said, there's a little buy button there. Um, this will be available afterwards as a broadcast. Um, I'm not sure when, but it'll it'll settle into that sooner or later. And uh, we're going to make this into a podcast later on as well. Paul, thank you very much. It's been brilliant. Well, thank you. And have a good day. You too, sir.